think we were on this page last uh, uh, last time. Um, we were talking about the evolution of the ideas here of the uh, um, of the pions, right? Of a, in a fine, this is called a Feynman diagram uh, of a uh, uh, an interaction between a proton and a neutron by the exchange of a pi meson, and how that evolved into um, a quark model that did the same thing. Here's the interaction of the pi meson, you see it got significantly more complicated and that the neutron and proton now have structure uh, with them, or which are the quarks. And then, uh, of course, we have to uh, rotate this one around to match that, but it, it's, uh, it's all right. Um, and then we had to add color to these because we were having a problem with uh, the two U's and the two D's having the same set of quantum numbers in the proton and neutron, which uh, is not allowed. So they had to invent another quantum number called the uh, color. Uh, and each, see, each, each of the quarks then has a different color, so it must have uh, a unique set of quantum numbers. And we're going to look at that evolution very quickly over a course of a week. Of course, this, uh, these ideas started happening about 1935 and reached uh, pinnacle uh, in about uh, 1972 or 73. Uh, so we're doing a, a whole lot of experience gathering at, at a uh, shallow, fairly shallow uh, mathematical level, uh, but you have to have that kind of overview of things before you understand why, what the mathematics is about that describes these. All right, so we're going to take a look today at uh, collisions and conservation laws, and there are a bunch of them. Yay. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like Chris. Um, all right, so uh, just to remind you, the strong force uh, uh, is what uh, provides the binding between a neutron and a proton, or a proton and a proton, for that matter. Uh, with a proton and a proton, the strong force has got to be more important uh, and more significant than the Coulombic repulsion and putting two protons next to each other, there's a huge electromagnetic propulsion, repulsion, I should say, force. And yet the strong force overcomes that and provides an additional 8 MeV of net binding energy. It's a 1 over R squared type force, though. Uh, but it, it's got an exponential term in there that the electromagnetic force doesn't have because the, electro, the exponential force depends upon having a, uh, an exchange interaction that is done at less than the speed of light. And the uh, exponential turns into a factor of one at the speed of light. Uh, there's a very nice article in The Physics Teacher by Anthony French uh, back when we thought we'd discovered a fifth force uh, and the things involved there. It's well worth reading to give you an idea of what the mathematics at a very manageable level looks like for these one over R squared terms. What do you mean we thought we discovered? I'm assuming we didn't. Uh, the, there were some measurements of the, the gravitational attraction of two objects at about a centimeter apart that were done very carefully and showed a deviation away from a one over R squared uh, type law. Okay. And uh, people just jumped on it. Uh, and a lot of incredibly clever experiments were done in bizarre situations uh, to test this idea. And in the end, it's not a fifth force. Wow. Oh. I was about to get excited there. <laughs> Uh, but it, uh, it shows you uh, that 
when, if you go back over a period of about four or five years when people were doing these experiments, they had some great ideas, just mm -hmm. fabulous. Cool. So uh, this is straight out of your textbook, but just a reminder that uh, the uh, order of the strength of the forces, uh, uh, the strong is the strongest, then the electromagnetic, then the weak, and then gravitational force is the weakest, but it's the one we endure most often or appear to endure most often um, in, in our everyday lives. So, particles. You know about the electron, we talked about the muon uh, and the pion and how those came about from cloud chamber experiments uh, and how people discovered what they were. We know about uh, protons down here and neutrons. Where did all the others come from? And the answer is we just kept throwing protons at protons and kept producing more and more particles that had unique masses and very unusual properties. And in that process, we would also produce uh, uh, mesons, and these mesons would also decay into leptons. Uh, so it allowed us to see all kinds of unusual features. Now, the detectors involved in these experiments uh, in the 50s were primarily the bubble chambers. Um, most of them used uh, liquid hydrogen, but not all of them. Some used uh, liquid uh, propane, I think. Uh, also, the uh, discovery of the neutrinos, uh, measurements of the neutrino was, it took more than 30 years after deciding that it existed to actually have experimental proof. And these days we have detectors that uh, some of them use mineral oil as the uh, detecting medium, but they fill gigantic underground caverns with, with these uh, um, uh, purified uh, mineral oil and watch for tiny events to take place. Matter of fact, the, uh, the largest detector we have for cosmic ray and muon detection is a cubic mile of ice in Antarctica. So a group of physicists went down to Antarctica, took some core samples of uh, ice in one particular glacier. It didn't move very fast and decided to put um, photomultiplier tubes down in there in an array that uh, turned it into uh, a scintillator, like your sodium iodide detectors that you've used, um, that involved about one cubic mile of ice. Why does it depend on like the area that you're doing the experiment over? Like, why would it matter between like a cubic mile versus like a cubic yard or something? Uh, the uh, neutrinos hardly interact with anything. So the more okay. material you can put in their path, the higher the probability that they'll interact with it and you can detect them. Gotcha. <clears throat> so unlike charged particles, neutrinos just go through everything and leave behind nothing until they totally interact uh, with something. So you can have uh, chlorine, and the chlorine, uh, if it absorbs a, nu uh, a neutrino, will turn into argon. And you can detect the argon. So uh, these, these uh, neutrino detectors are rather large, uh, but there are quite a number of them, like, I don't know, 20 or so around the world all tuned to looking at different kinds of events and different kinds of uh, measurements of the neutrinos. And you notice up here, there are three different kinds of neutrinos, plus their antiparticles. And it ends up that one, that the neutrinos seem to turn into each other. 
Uh, and that's a very puzzling uh, property of neutrinos. And just uh, last week, uh, a new measurement was made on this, what they call neutrino oscillations. Uh, and there may be evidence from that to explain why there's so little antimatter in the universe compared to regular matter. So that could be a, a profound discovery uh, if it uh, pans out and if the uh, understanding of the experiment uh, is what we think. So we've got masses here, uh, and these are in MEVs. Uh, so you can see that a number of these uh, heavier ones, which are all called baryons, um, are no less than the proton. The proton's the lightweight one in, the, in this group. And if you go to the, uh, the mesons, remember the mesons were named as uh, uh, having a mass intermediate between a proton and an electron. So they were uh, mesoparticles. Uh, and the one we thought that was first detected to be a, a, a meson and is still called a mu meson is in fact not a meson at all, but a lepton. It is much more uh, like an electron uh, than, is, uh, than a muon is like any of these other mesons. So it was the discovery of the pion that led us into the avalanche of mesons. And you notice that one of these mesons has a mass that's actually greater than the proton. So it just barely violates that principle that uh, mesons have masses less than a proton and more than an electron. All right, there are quantum numbers associated with these things that you might find peculiar, but baryons have baryon quantum numbers. Seems very self-serving, but that's what they do. And leptons have their own separate little um, fiefdom of quantum numbers. So the electrons and the electron neutrinos have their lep lepton numbers, and their antiparticles are minus ones. Uh, and uh, the muon and the muon neutrino have their muon lepton numbers, and uh, the tau is the same way. All right. These are some of the decay modes. Um, you notice there aren't many stable particles uh, here. You've got a proton, a tau neutrino, a muon neutrino, and an electron a neutrino. And those three are stable only because they keep changing into each other. Uh, and then something that we can lay our hands on is the electron. So the electron and the proton are stable in the nucleus. The neutron is stable only because it's allowed to turn itself into a proton and then turn itself back into a neutron inside the nucleus. So you could say it's never really stable, but inside of a nucleus it is. Um, outside it's got a, a much shorter uh, lifetime. Now, um, you notice under the baryons, there's a, a group of particles that have a, a half-life of 10 to the minus 10 seconds. And then there's a group that have a half-life of about 10 to the minus 24 seconds. Oops, I'm getting up into the mesons there. Uh, here's one 10 to the minus 20. Okay, so these are considered to be nuclear strong decay 
these are considered the 10 to the minus 10 to be strange particles. And they are officially named strange particles because of this. Because of this and another property uh, that they're always produced in pairs. So among the baryons then, there's a number called the strangeness number. And it's given uh, a value of minus one, uh, minus two, and minus three. And that's also a strange behavior since all the others seem to have just unit quantum numbers that the strangeness would have this, this behavior here. What exactly is that a scale of? I'm not sure I understand the question. Try me like again. Like the strangest number. What, it, what exactly does that mean? It's a quantum number. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and so uh, we ought to talk a little bit about uh, what that means, but I, I wanted to point out something that your textbook did. Uh, and um, this is something called the standard model that we'll get to when we get to quarks, because here are the quarks. Uh, but you might ask in this model, where are the hadrons? That is the mesons and the baryons. Uh, because the leptons are here, but uh, your protons and neutrons aren't, and that's because all of the hadrons, baryons and mesons, are made up of quarks. Electrons and muons and tau particles are not. And so when we get down to the simplest model of everything, it's the quarks now that hold supreme over the protons and neutrons. Your textbook refers to these other things over here in orange as field particles. And that includes the photon. And we'll find that these are the things that exchange <clears throat> properties between particles. So, uh, the electron will, uh, well, let's, we'll get into it in a minute. And then you've got the Higgs boson. And the Higgs is the, an interaction mechanism, a particle that brings about the origin of mass itself from energy. It, it isn't, everything doesn't have a Higgs. It just brings about that particular field. Um, so you've studied the electromagnetic field and we have photons in there. And particle, charged particles will uh, emit and absorb photons uh, as a way to exchange energy. And with that field is complete. We, you've studied it in 204 and maybe uh, our advanced class. Uh, gravitational field is complete, except we don't understand what it's anything about its exchange particle, if it has one. Each of these other particles is associated with a field. And you haven't studied them at all. And just like the electromagnetic field has Maxwell's equations, all these different fields have their own set of equations that describe them. So with that, let's talk about conservation laws. So uh, Noether, uh, she was a, a brilliant theoretician who published this theorem that people are still getting ideas from. Um, but it pretty much says every conservation law is associated with a symmetry of some kind in the underlying physics. 
So you'll find when you read modern literature, they talk more about symmetry than they do conservation, since one implies the other. So here are your exact conservation laws. Conservation of mass energy. Conservation of linear momentum. Conservation of angular momentum. Conservation of electric charge. You've been dealing with these for your time here. And you're probably reasonably comfortable with them. But you have yet to see or encounter CPT violation, which is parity, time reversal, and charge conjugation. We're going to be talking a little bit about <laughs> conservation of color charge. Conservation of weak isospin, which is somewhat the origin of the strangeness uh, quantum number. And then the conservation of probability, which has to do with the wave function. These are exact. They work everywhere all the time. Here are the approximate conservation laws. Baryon number. Well, that works when you're dealing with strong forces, but not with weak forces. Electron, lepton number, and then all the others that go with it. The uh, uh, muon uh, lepton number and the tau lepton number. Those are all individual, and I just put that down as one here. Strangeness number. So we're going to find that strangeness is conserved in these uh, reactions. Something we haven't talked about yet at all, hypercharge. Parity we've mentioned in our nuclear physics about uh, when you interchange the position of two particles, does the wave function, is the wave function symmetric or anti-symmetric? Flavor, now oh, you're going to love that one. That comes with the, uh, comes along with color uh, and the, has to do with the quarks. Charge conjugation, uh, that's interchanging the charges of two particles. Time reversal is just what it sounds like. And CP symmetry is the parity and charge con conjugation done at the same time. These all work sometime. And you might think, well, how are you going to know? And it's just like the baryon number. Uh, if uh, if you're not having a strong interaction, then the baryon number is not a conserved quantity. It's only conserved in strong interactions. So each of these has a qualifier with it. Uh, and I thought it was more important for you just to see the, the number of these things uh, rather than uh, delve into all the de details. If you want to read a little bit more about these, because there's a partial differential equation that goes with every conserved quantity uh, that has to do with the outflow of stuff. So with uh, charge conservation, if we look at a, a volume, the divergence of the field uh, is equal to the time rate of change of the charge density in there. Uh, that, that's your partial differential equation. You can see all of these if you just want to uh, find some amusement or some insight uh, from this Wikipedia article. So, why don't we try some of these conservation laws? Baryon number means the sum of the baryon numbers before is equal to the sum of the baryon numbers afterwards. Is this a reaction that can take place? Can a proton plus a neutron turn all of their mass energy into a proton, an antiproton? I couldn't get the bar above it. So, and a neutron. No. No. Why not? Well, I guess, first of all, there's a lot of, like, mass energy. That is not, like, you know, you can't just create mass energy. 
And also you have like three you, you, you bring a proton in with a lot of kinetic energy, so uh, it collides yeah. and then you can convert some of that energy into mass. Well, you started with two baryons, now we end up with three, you can do this. Right, so just the baryon number here, one and one, one minus one, one. So the baryon number on this side is two, baryon number on this side is one. So we could turn it into a proton plus a proton plus two neutrons. Would that work? Wouldn't you need enough energy to do so? I just assume we brought in enough energy to do it. What's the baryon number over here total? Two. Two. So if I have a proton and an antiproton, that's plus one and minus one, so that's zero. So if I've got two neutrons, that would be two. So I'd have two equals to two. That will conserve baryon number. Then I've got to go back and look at all the other things. Mass energy, well, you got to have enough energy bring, coming in, kinetic energy, to create these masses, but that's possible. Charge conservation. We can serve charge here. What's the charge of a proton? Positive. Plus one, right? Yes. Neutron? Nothing. Nope. So the charge on this side is plus one. Plus one. Charge of the proton plus antiprotus minus, minus. One. those two add to zero and my two neutrons. Zero. Oh no, the charge is no charge not conserved. What? Charge is not conserved, so it can't happen. Oh. How about this one? Mu minus goes to an e minus plus an anti-electron neutrino and a muon neutrino. Muon, what, what's the muon neutrino? Is it negative one? Or uh, it, the anti-particles are always the negative and the particles themselves oh, okay. are positive. Uh, no, it wouldn't be. No way, it would, because that's there's a negative and a positive, so that cancels. So, yeah, it would be conserved. The, the charge would be. Okay, so what have we got here for the electron and the... Uh, the, the electron-lepton number is plus one, even though it's minus. And the uh, neutrino number is plus one. And the... Uh, Muon has pluses, so they're all Yeah, they're all negative too, aren't they? When they have plus one. So this has plus one muon uh, lepton number. And what's the muon lepton number for an electron? It, it was plus one, right? No, that's the electron lepton number. What's the muon lepton number? Zero. Zero. And the muon lepton number for an anti-electron neutrino? Zero. You. Uh. And the... Uh, muon lepton number for a muon neutrino is one plus one. So I get plus one is equal to plus one. So the muon numbers work. What's the electron lepton number for a muon? Zero. Zero. What is it for an electron? One plus one. What is it for an anti? Electron neutrino. Ne uh, negative one. Negative one. 
So I get zero on this side, and this is a reaction that can happen. Hey. I did, uh, when I was in high school, I did uh, some nuclear emulsion uh, experiments. Actually, I, I, uh, Kodak gave me some plates, and I took them up on the nearest mountain and left them there for a week and then went and got the plates and developed them and spent a couple of weeks scanning them with a microscope because these are pretty small events. And I had one muon to electron event. So it was a light trailing particle that then made sort of a V-shape with a heavy track particle coming off. Dang, when I was in high school, I was playing baseball and screwing around. <laughs> well, day to day I, play, I played a lot of golf. I played a lot of golf. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Dr. P, do you play golf up at Sewanee? Yeah, occasionally. Uh, if I could get all these papers graded, I'd play a lot more. <laughs> how are the paper? How are the... Uh, how are the tests looking? I haven't even looked at them. I have to go up and print them out so I can grade them. Okay. I haven't gotten that far yet. Uh, all right. Sorry, I didn't mean to change subject. No. Uh, I'll, today's Wednesday. I, I hope I'll get those to you before Friday. Okay, strangeness numbers. We, do we need to go back? We're going to have a... Ion, a proton, a kaon, and a, a what's that symbol? We the capital delta, isn't it? Lambda. You don't, you don't know the lambda pi's, the lambda pi alpha, or lambda chi. Lambda, well, there's lambda chi and there's lambda pi alpha. <laughs> Ion, no strangeness number. Proton, no strangeness number. Where's the lambda? Ah, there's the lambda. Minus one for strangeness. And what was the other one? The K, was it, uh, was it a Kaon? I've forgotten now. Yeah, the K0. Kaon. What's the strangeness number for a K uh, meson? Plus one. Plus one. Let's see. <laughs> you notice there's, this is, this is very strange. Uh, the subscripts here, the same mass, same everything, except their lifetimes are different. So that's short, and that's long. Uh, then the K plus is also a, uh, has a strangeness of plus one. So what did we have over there? The neutral? Yeah, we had the neutral K. We don't know if it's short or long, but what was its quantum number? Strangest quantum number? Plus one? Plus one. Plus one. And what was the uh, lambda? It was minus, minus one. Minus one. No, so one. zero strangeness on this side, zero strangeness on this side. So this could work. As a matter of fact, this is one of the oddities uh, that they realized there was something different. You would see a lot of these, but no other neutral particle was ever produced like a neutron. And people wondered why. And so they said, well, there's got to be a quantum number that's preventing this from, from happening. So that's where the strangeness quantum number came from. <laughs> well, it wasn't just their half-lives being odd. It was the fact that... Uh, uh, if you replace one of these particular particles with a neutron, for instance, the reaction was never found. 
All right. So we've got a few minutes here. Uh, let's uh, take a look at a couple of problems. So uh, the very first problem was about high energy proton uh, or pi on traveling near the, near the speed of light collides with the nucleus. Uh, and it travels about three femtometers before interacting. How much time does it take for the strong interaction to occur? From just from that uh, measurement. How do you do that? So how long does it take for it to travel three femtometers at the speed of light? Not very long. And the answer would be? Well, I need my trusty calculator. <laughs> yes. Uh, one times 10 to the minus 23 seconds. So 10 to the minus 23 seconds. And, and that's an interesting number. Ten to the minus twenty-four, six times ten to the minus twenty-four seconds is the time that we've got for the lifetimes of these uh, particles that we say decay by the strong force. So the strong force has to do with a propagation of events across a particle whose spatial extent is about one femtometer meter, and whatever the interaction time is, it can't be faster move faster than the speed of light. So this it implies that this is about the shortest amount of time that you would expect for a particle to live uh, that's unstable uh, with respect to the strong force. Okay, so a, a neutral rho zero meson decays into a pi plus and a pi minus. And the half-life is about 10 to the minus 23 seconds. And that's a strong interaction. A neutral K meson will also decay, decay, uh, <laughs> decay into a pi plus and a pi minus but at 10 to the minus 10 seconds. What's the difference? So it ends up that the weak force has half-lives typically on this level. So the force that causes these two pions to be released from the decay of the K uh, meson is completely different than from the rope meson. This is a strong interaction, this is the weak interaction. By the way, you can see this in a bubble chamber. Things that travel at the speed of light uh, would travel three tenths of three millimeters, uh, and you would easily see that uh, um, when this K0 was created, there'd be this gap of about three, uh, three millimeters. You wouldn't see anything because the K on is neutral, and then you'd suddenly see the two pions come off. So basically the rho mesons just acted on by strong forces? 
It's strong forces that or cause the decay. Okay. And you, you can't see this in the track of a bubble chamber, but by measuring uh, the momentum and the uh, and using the known um, rest mass energies of these particles, you can use the relativistic equation for total energy of these particles and determine if they came from a single particle or from another interaction. Um, and that allows you to get an estimate uh, of up, up directly up to about 10 to the minus 16 seconds. 10 to the minus 23rd seconds, we use the uncertainty principle, delta E, delta T. All right. Let's take a look at this problem with uh, two two muons collide and produce uh, a, a high, let's see, a, a, so a mu minus collides with an electron and produces two neutrinos. What are they? What conservation law do you use? Conservation uh, like the the muon numbers, lepton numbers. Yeah, the lepton numbers. Okay, so you have electron lepton numbers and muon lepton numbers. What's the uh, electron lepton number for an electron? Plus one. Plus one. Okay. So that means on this side, one of those neutrinos has to be an electron-lepton. <clears throat> so that'll be an electron-neutrino, won't it? And if it's on this side, it's got to be a plus one. And so is it the anti-neutrino or the neutrino? Anti-neutrino. It's got to be the anti-neutrino. That's, yeah, that's what I was... Oh. So we've got the mu plus, plus an electron. Goes to two neutrinos. And so this one, so the electron... Lepton number zero plus one. So one of these has to be plus one, doesn't it? That makes it an electron neutrino. And to be a plus one, it's just a regular neutrino, not the anti-neutrino. Okay, how about for the muon uh, lepton numbers? What's the muon lepton number for a mu plus? Plus one. Remember, it's the negative leptons that have the positive uh, lepton number. By the way, on a test, I'll give you that table. So, <laughs> what's, the <I> muon, hope. <laughs> <laughs> what's the muon lepton number for an electron? Zero. <laughs> no, one. It's one or zero? Oh, uh, maybe zero. One. No, it's zero. It never mind it. Whatever it's called. One. Okay. How about the electron or the mu lepton number for the uh, electron neutrino? Minus one. Mu minus one would be the antiparticle. Oh. Because it's an electron, it doesn't have a muon number. So that makes this thing be a uh, muon, but is it the 
muon or the anti-muon? Because what does its muon lepton number have to be? Negative one, so it's muon. Minus one, yeah. So what kind of neutrino is that? Is it a regular neutrino or an anti-neutrino? Regular? No, I say anti. Yeah, the right. Oh, say anti. anti. Oh. <laughs> there you go. So that's how you play this game. And it is somewhat of a game. Um, uh, couldn't you just like, from the fact that uh, conservation of charge, we have like, you know, like it's like plus one, negative one on the left side, so it's zero. So we have to have like a neutral charge on the right. So if we have already, oh, uh, uh, well, isn't it neutrino negative or neutral? It's neutral, right? It's neutral, oh, yeah. It's neutral. No, it's a one. And they have a they have a rest mass on the order of one to two eV. So, and and that's that's a recent discovery um, <coughs> from the late nineteen eighties. All right. Let's take these two. Um, I'll work the second one. Uh, let's see. If your last name starts with an M or greater, you're going to do the second one with me. If your last name is starts with an, uh, uh, an L or less in the alphabet, you're going to do the first one. So we're going to check baryon number and charge conservation. Could you possibly pull up the chart? Thanks. So we just are finding baryon number of like the final thing. Uh, the, the, you're finding the sum of the baryon numbers on the left before the reaction, and then on the right after the reaction. Okay. So uh, this is almost like a chemical equation where you're adding up properties. Um, and the chemistry, it's, it's just the uh, um, atomic numbers that you check. Wait, was the first, was that, oh, wait, is it epsilon plus? Is that what ours was? Um, I forgot what was on the other slide. It was... Pi minus and the proton, the pi minus plus epsilon something. It was uh, uh, pi minus and a sigma plus. Oh, six. Yeah, sigma. My bad. <laughs> okay, is everybody done? How about charge conservation? Do they both? I mean, that's pretty obvious from the signs there. Uh, what's the sum of the uh, uh, charges before the collision uh, in the uh, A through L group? Zero. Zero and zero on both sides. Zero and zero on both sides. And uh, for the uh, M, M to Z group? It was, it's one and one, right? Uh, let's see, you've got a pi minus and a proton, so that's zero. Oh, so it's zero and zero. Sorry, I was adding the other thing. Yeah. Oi. <laughs> what, about, what about baryon? <laughs> What's the baryon number on the left and, on, for either either one of these reactions? Uh, plus, plus one. one. Plus one. 
And on the right hand side, it's plus one. That that yeah, that's what I meant. I set the baryon number <laughs> because the the K has that, zero no. value. The, the K, K is, is zero. zero. The K <laughs> the K is zero, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And sigma is sigma plus is plus one. So great, they obey all the rules. The first one uh, that gives you the K minus and the sigma plus is always observed. The second one that gives you the uh, I minus and the sigma plus is never observed to happen. Why? What, what conservation law does the second reaction violate that the first one does not? Nobody's got it figured out. I don't know. Look at strangeness. It's strange. Oh, of course. Oh, the strange. Oh, okay. So, what's the strangest value for the K minus? Uh, or plus one? Actually, that's the strangeness for the regular particle. The antiparticle is the negative of it, so it will be minus one. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. All right. And what's the strangest number for a sigma plus? The sigma plus, yeah. negative one? Or sigma plus. So it's negative one. And, negative uh, K minus is uh, negative one. Wait, K minus is negative one or positive one? Negative one. K minus is negative one. It's the antiparticle. Okay, I got you. I got you. Um, I, let's see. I take that back. I, I think the strangeness number applies the same to each one. So K plus and K minus are both strangeness plus one. Oh yeah, that's, that was why I was a little confused. Plus one. Plus one. Okay. So, um, and then the sigma plus down below is uh, minus one. So strangeness is conserved in that reaction on top, isn't it? That is correct. Zero on the left, zero on the right. Well, the bottom one, strangeness is zero on the left, but the pi meson doesn't have a strangeness. So we end up with just the uh, uh, minus one from the sigma plus. So that's not observed. All right. So those are the kinds of things that... Uh, uh, people were able to divine from all these different collisions and the things that would happen and the things that would not happen. And you need to just kind of get used to uh, doing this. So there's a number of uh, problems in there that just say, does this happen? Does this not? And if it doesn't, why not? So take a look at them. Uh, and then what we're going to do next time, uh, before we really jump into the pi, uh, up into the quarks, is we're going to look at the uh, kinematics of these collisions to find out how we get information from collisions and what kind of information we get. Uh, and I think you'll find that interesting uh, because uh, the question is, in a bubble chamber, if you see uh, three particles... Uh, 
come out from a, a, a collision of a proton with a proton, for instance, or a pion with a proton, did all three come from the decay of what was created, or were, were there two particles created and one of them immediately decayed into two others? And th there's a very big difference in those two kinds of collision events in the momentum and energy relationships. So we'll take a look at that uh, on Friday. All right, guys. Right, uh, Peterson, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, so are we still writing uh, a term of paper, or we are not doing this? You're doing it, aren't you? Oh, um, I was just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> You've been holding your breath and hoping not? <laughs> no, I, just, I was making sure, because like, we haven't talked about it in a while, so I was just making sure. You know. Oh, that, that's because you're, you're picking subjects probably that we've already discussed so right. uh, if you have any if you need any uh, thing any issues related to your papers let me know I can get you some more information or some example problems all right thank you uh, no chance that gets cancelled pardon <laughs> no chance that gets cancelled what's the probability of the term paper being cancelled you can play more golf <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just think of all the extra papers you'll have to do. Dr. P, it's almost over. Help us out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. I have another question. So, like, there's uh, an introduction to modern physics class, which is like two credits. Yes. Uh, yeah, like, I was just wondering how, like, how it's compared to this class. Oh, it, uh, the stuff we did last semester during the first. For seven or eight weeks, it kind of cherry picks some ideas out of there. Uh, the people who we offer modern every other year, but if you walk into uh, advanced lab without some modern physics under your belt, you just get blown away. Yeah. Um, so is that like designed uh, for people like in advanced lab, kind of? It's designed for people who are in that odd uh scheduling where they can take modern when they're sophomores or seniors if you're three two you were supposed to take modern and you can't it, if it didn't occur to you when you were a sophomore at the beginning of that year that you needed to be in it uh, you've just messed up your uh, your whole schedule um, so it's a way to get some quantum mechanics uh, into you, and then you can pick up some further quantum mechanics uh, if you take thermo. Why is it only two credits? It meets every, well, technically it meets once a week for 15, but we're going to meet three days a week for half a semester. Um, and then it ends at midterm. Yeah, but I mean, like, so this like this class is has more content than this, right? So I don't need to take intro to modern again, right? Because oh I, no, no, it's it's uh, it really makes the uh, introduction uh, in the first semester part much see. easier. We're trying to to make that something that everybody takes at the beginning of their sophomore year uh, as. Some places take a have a a lot of places have a three semester intro course where a, a modern physics is attached uh, as the third semester, and uh, we can't do that because there's just not enough of us to teach it. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm willing to do a half credit on it, so we'll do that and then. Modern, then modern, when you get it, allows you to have more time on individual subjects. Yeah. So when is this uh, term paper due? At the final. Okay. <clears throat> so it's not due, it's the last day of classes, it's due just before the final? Here's is due tomorrow, I'll... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making sure I'm getting things. Oh, right. We'll make yours due on Monday. That gives you the weekend, right? <laughs> Can that be the final? 
Pardon? The final is just going to be over chapter uh, 15. Okay. All right. So it's not really a final. It's just a chapter test. Sweet. Well, I hope it's easy. Ah, <laughs> uh, you wish. <laughs> yeah. it, it is. What do you mean? <laughs> You'll have some of these things on it. Conservation laws. I like that. Yeah, me too, but I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and we we have, won't have neutrino there. oscillations on there. Uh, two years ago, they did. Uh, and the difference in the books is right now, you would be looking at an equation that was on two lines instead of one, uh, full of derivatives. Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, and um, was your introduction to quantum uh, uh, relativistic theory. And, you know, very interesting stuff. All right, guys. Um, be sure to get your posters in if you haven't done that already.